We'll turn to the book of Judges once again, please. And we're going to read, I'm going to read the first 15 verses of chapter one, Judges chapter one, verses one through 15. And we're going to look at the commencement of this campaign to drive out the Canaanites. And so it begins in verse one. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord saying, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon, his brother, come up with me into my lot that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him. And they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings have, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. As I have done, so God hath requited me, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem, and had taken it, and smitten it with the edge of the sword, and set the city on fire. And afterwards the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain, and in the south, and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron, now, the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arbor, and they slew Sheshai and Ahiman and Talmai, and from thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir. And the name of Debir before was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him. Aksa, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted from off her ass. And Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word uh, to our hearts. So we've observed that the people of Israel were rightful owners now of the land of Canaan, but they didn't possess it all. Uh, there were still pockets of Canaanite resistance. And the idea was this, that Joshua and his campaigns in the book of Joshua had basically broken the back of Canaanite resistance, had defeated generally the armies of, of the Canaanites. And now it was left to the individual tribes to drive out what was left of the Canaanites in each of their possessions. And of course, uh, it begins on a very positive note. They do quite well. Uh, but as we go through the book, we'll see that uh, they failed uh, in this task of driving out the Canaanites. And eventually they settled amongst them and, of course, it would cause them all kinds of difficulties. So that's basically the general tenor of the book. And again, there's a, there's a great parallel in a sense that when we think of our own salvation, uh, Christ finished the work and defeated the enemy at Calvary. He cried out, it's finished. The, uh, the, the back of the enemy, as it were, was broken. But there are still pockets of resistance, <laughs> and uh, particularly... Uh, some of the resistance is in our own flesh uh, that fails, uh, causes us to fail to enter in to the fullness of our inheritance that the Lord has provided for us through the victory of our Joshua, Jehovah saves, and the work that he did on Calvary. And the lesson we can learn from Judges is this, that uh, there's a lot more land for us to possess. There's a lot more for us to inherit. There's a lot more blessings that have been won for us, but we'll only enjoy them if we get serious about defeating the enemy 
in our personal lives. And then we'll enter into the fullness that he intended us to experience. So very, very practical. A lot of things in this chapter that really relate to sanctification and our enjoyment of the riches of our inheritance that we have in Christ. So we want to make that practical application as we go. And we said that this it begins on a very positive note. We kind of quickly at the end talked about how this worked. It says, uh, it starts with after the death of Joshua. And of course, uh, this great leader has now passed from the scene. And there's another generation uh, that are left after him. And oftentimes after someone who's been a great leader of the people of God, passes from the scene. There's always this question mark. Well, what about the next generation? Are there going to be any great leaders amongst them? Uh, Is God going to uh, somehow raise up others uh, to take the place of them? And so, of course, uh, twice, actually, in these early chapters, the death of Joshua is mentioned. It's mentioned here in chapter one. It's mentioned again in chapter two, both in this prologue section and in chapter two, verse seven uh, through 10, we get it again. Now, in the second mention, it's not just kind of talking about the death of Joshua, but it's it's talking about the generation that were with Joshua and even the generation that followed uh, Joshua. And so it's kind of emphasizing uh, his contemporaries. So verse 7, of chapter 2, it says, The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. So his contemporaries who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the mountain of Ephraim, in the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all the generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation of them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So now we're dealing with this third generation. And again, we talked about that last time, that sometimes the third generation, everything's handed to them on a plate. They don't appreciate it like uh, those that have fought for it, those that have tried hard to maintain it. And of course, uh, it ends up uh, as being a time of declension and departure. And that's exactly what we get here. Now, of course, these Canaanites that they're fighting against, it tells us again in verse 1, chapter 1, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And we've mentioned that these Canaanites, it's a general designation all the enemies of Israel that inhabited the promised land and included the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites. But they're all under this general title of the Canaanites because they lived in the land of Canaan. And of course, there were different groups, but they all lived in the land of Canaan. They used in a general sense. We said they were worshippers of Baal, a male fertility god. And so there's a lot of Uh, because fertility to do with reproduction, sexuality, and all this kind of stuff. And of course, his female counterpart was Asherah. And so there was great wickedness amongst the Canaanites. That's why uh, God commanded their judgment upon them. Uh, They they were morally uh, debauched. And again, we're going to come across this as we go through this book, you know, the big question of how did God allow this uh, to happen? You know, it's the basically genocide of of all these nations that lived in the land. And if you look at Leviticus chapter 18, uh, you get... Uh, graphic description, and we're not going to take the time to read it all, but uh, just at the end of uh, chapter 18, verse 24 and 25, this warning is given to the Israelites, and it says this, defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, this horrendous description of the morality of the Canaanites. And so he says, defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. And it's a very interesting description. It's it's, it's like their sin was so great, the picture is that it actually made the land 
vomit <laughs> because uh, creation is directly related to its fallen head, Adam, and the descendants of Adam. And so, you know, kind of like today, there's a lot of talk about climate change and all this kind of stuff. And basically, what the Bible tells us actually is when there's convulsions, when there's all these, it's actually related to man's sin. If we're really concerned uh, about cleaning up uh, our world, uh, it, it's not environmentalism that's needed. It's spiritual and moral revival that is needed. That will change our climate. That will change our whole uh, sphere of, of our world. The world is today vomiting because of basically the sins of the Canaanites described in Levit Leviticus chapter 18 are very evident in Western civilization. And I'm talking Canada, the US, Europe. Uh, it, we're, we're doing the very same things. And it's really interesting that this, the Canaanites, God says, basically they're ripe for judgment. He had given them 400 years uh, to repent. He had given them warnings with the destruction of other nations like the Egyptians. Uh, they had every reason to recognize that God hates sin and God judges sin. And yet they fail to repent. And so now they're ripe for judgment. So how are they going to do this? Well, it tells us that, uh, and we, again, we mentioned these things very quickly last time, but it really began with unity. Notice it begins with the children of Israel asking the Lord together. So they're, they're together as no national disunity at this point. The children of Israel together are asking who will go first against the Canaanites? They're asking the Lord this. So there's great unity. They're together on this. When we get to the end of Judges, there's not great unity. They're, going, they're asking the Lord again, who shall go up? But it's against the Benjamites. It's against their own people. And there's great disunity. But at this point, they're unified. They're asking the Lord. It also began with prayer. Uh, they ask God directly in prayer, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites? And of course, the, land gave, the Lord gave clear answer to their prayers, uh, probably through the Urim and Thummim. Uh, the, the decision was made that Judah will go up first, and we'll talk more about that. But it also began with fellowship, because although Judah go up first, we want to observe that they, they invite, verse 3, Simeon to join them in the fight. And they say uh, to Simeon, his brother, verse 3, uh, come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites. I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And again, we'll think about that. Was that disobedience on their part? Was it like a faith on their part? Or was it a good thing? Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that it was a very good thing. It began with fellowship together. We'll explain that more. And it began with victory because they had a promise from God in verse 4. Judah went up. The Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. They slew of them Bezek, 10,000 men. And of course, the Lord had promised this victory to them. Uh, in verse two, the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. So just like God said, uh, he promised that he delivered the land into their hands and he gave them the victory and they enjoyed the victory and they went together for the victory. Now, why Judah first? Well, first of all, Judah was the largest and the most powerful of the tribes of Israel, and it was also the kingly tribe. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go back, please, to chapter Genesis chapter 49, when we read about the assessment of the various sons of Jacob, we're given a hint here of the leadership role that Judah would take. And so in Genesis 49 and verse 8, it says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. And so uh, Judah is 
uh, told ahead of time uh, that they're, they're going to be the ones that their brethren will praise. They're going to be the ones uh, that will have their uh, as it were, their hand on the neck of their enemies. They're going to be the, the warrior tribe, the leadership tribe. And it is interesting that we, we know that Judah uh, means praise. So what we're learning here is after the mantle uh, had fallen from Joshua, it was the tribe of Judah now that was to take the leadership role in expelling the Canaanites. They were the first to do this. And Judah, as we've said, means praise. And um, of course, uh, Psalm 50, 23 says this, whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me. And I want to suggest to you that this is very, uh, typically very important. What it's telling us is this, that praise precedes victory in battle. Judah is praised. They're going to go up first, and God will give the victory. And I believe that Jehoshaphat understood this very well. And if you look with me for a moment at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to read verses 21 and 22. And again, they're going into battle. And it says, <clears throat> Verse 21, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord and that, that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, uh, <clears throat> sorry, sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. And so uh, it, it's just interesting, isn't it, that praise precedes victory. And I want to suggest to you that if we're having a lot of spiritual struggles and a lot of defeats in our Christian life, that maybe one of the areas that needs adjustment in our lives is the area of praise. Maybe we're not praising enough. Maybe we're not speaking well enough of the Lord uh, in our daily uh, experience with him. And I want to suggest to you that it certainly is essential to living a victorious life for the Lord Jesus is living a life that is filled with praise. And certainly uh, Judah will go first. And he, God had delivered the enemy into his hands, Judah signifying praise. And then we said that um, they, Judah invited Simeon to join him. And again, some commentators are critical of this. They're saying, you know, God told Judah. He didn't tell Simeon. Well, why didn't he just do it himself? But again, uh, I, I want to suggest to you that there's, there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, um, these were, were, first of all, blood brothers. If you look back to Genesis 35, uh, they're... Ancestry is, is detailed here, and we'll notice in verse 23, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. So, blood brothers, same father, same mother, uh, both descendants of uh, Jacob through Leah. And then they also had a shared inheritance. If you look at the book of Joshua now, previous book, chapter 19 and verse 1, you will observe that they actually shared the inheritance. And the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families, and their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. So Judah and Simeon's inheritance was shared. They, they shared the inheritance together. And so <clears throat> it's only fitting that these blood brothers who shared the same inheritance should fight for the inheritance together. And so David, uh, who had seen a lot of the disunity in his early years and the devastating effects of it uh, in the kingdom, he was the author of that lovely psalm, Psalm 133, Verse one, where he says this, how good 
and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And he goes on and the end of it says, for there God commands the blessing, even life forevermore. And there is great blessing in unity as we face the enemy, as we go into battle. And uh, in the New Testament, we use this language. We call it the fellowship of the gospel. And, and it's wonderful to experience that fellowship of the gospel as we take the fight to the enemy unitedly together. And I love what C.A. Coates uh, says concerning this. He says, we must not move without our brethren. While it remains true, we can get everything from God. In an abstract sense, everything comes from God, even help from the brethren. And so we're not only to get help from God, but also help from our brethren. And so there's, there's a wonderful aspect here of unity and fellowship together in the battles of the Lord. And so I don't believe there's anything wrong with this. The Lord doesn't condemn it. Uh, he still gives the victory to them, and they go together in unity to fight against the enemy. And so it says in verse 4, Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites, the Perizzites, into their hand, and they slew of them Bezek, 10,000 men. And verse 5, they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. So we come across this character now, Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Uh, Adonai Bezek, of course, Adonai, we, we should be very familiar with that. It means Lord or Master, and uh, it's, it's a name that's used of God. And uh, so Adonai and then Bezek means lightning or scattering. And, and I suppose the idea of a lightning, scattered lightning, is the idea. And uh, so obviously a very frightening thing. A lot of people are scared of lightning and thunder. It scares them. And so he takes this kind of frightening term, the Lord of Bezek. And um, <clears throat> they, it tells us that, that not only was he defeated, although he fled in verse 6, Adonai Bezek fled, they pursued after him, caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And again, it seems almost a little bit brutal, this uh, uh, kind of uh, naming the person for life, basically. And uh, again, those that are uh, critics of, of God and, and God's methods and God's justice, they'll say, you know, look at this. This is, this is God's people and look what they've done to this man and all the rest of it. Funnily enough, Adonai Bezek didn't share the liberal's opinion of how he was treated. He didn't feel like he was badly treated at all. In fact, he's very philosophical about it all. In verse 7, it says, Adonai Bezek said, three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table as I have, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. And so basically, he, his opinion is, well, I got what I deserved. <laughs> uh, I've done it to others, and guess what? It came back on me. And so he basically, uh, he didn't have any difficulty with the treatment, and he acknowledges the justice of his fate, having meted out the same punishment on 70 kings that he had captured and humiliated and treated like dogs under his table. He accepts, as I have done, he says in verse 7, as I have done, so God hath requited me. I think he understood a principle that is found clearly taught in the scriptures. And that is this, Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. It's, a, it's an infallible law of God. We sow what we reap. And so if we sow to the flesh, Scripture says, of the flesh we will reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, <laughs> uh, we'll reap everlasting life. And so what, what we sow is what we get. And this man, well, he had sowed uh, violence uh, and humiliation of his enemies, and he reaped the same. 
and he could see the justice of it and he understood it and he understood that God was absolutely just to requite him for what he had done to others. It's interesting, isn't it? That principle of sowing and reaping. We always reap the same thing that we sow. If you sow uh, wheat, <laughs> you expect that you're going to get wheat, right? If you sow barley, you expect you're going to get barley. You, you, you reap what you sow. It's a law of the harvest. You also always reap later than when you sow. There's a very famous sermon by Billy Sunday, payday someday. <laughs> and the idea is you sow the flesh, you know, it says you sow the wind, you're going to reap a whirlwind, right? And, and so there's, there's a day coming. So well, you always reap later than when you sow. And it always happens in greater measure than what you sow. The farmer sows in his field, he expects to get more. You put one, I love the illustration of the potato. If you put one potato uh, and, uh, in the ground and allow it to die, it, it won't be just one potato that you get when you come to harvest. It'll be a whole bunch of potatoes, right? You'll get more than you sow. Uh, that's the principle of the harvest. Uh, you always get more than you sow. And so these are very important principles. And so this Adonai Bezek, Lord of Lightning, uh, he it says he, they brought him to Jerusalem and there he died. This man, who had been obviously a very violent man, dies, ironically, in the city of peace. But I want us to draw a spiritual application from this before we, we move on from this. And I think it's a very important illustration that uh, can powerfully speak to us in a sense. Remember, there were 70 kings that were under his table. No thumbs, no big toes, and basically living off the scraps that were under his table. And I believe this is a powerful illustration of anybody who has given in to the enemy. See, at some point, these 70 kings surrendered to Adonai Bezek, Lord of Lightning, and this was their fate. And I think the principle is true that if we allow the enemy to, to win against us, wh what was their condition? Well, if you cut off somebody's big toes, it affects their ability to walk or run properly, doesn't it? it you, your toes are pretty important, your big toes. Cut them off and your ability to walk, your ability to run. You cut off your thumb that's going to affect your ability to wield the sword. You're not going to be, so you're going to be basically useless militarily. You, you can't walk, you can't run very well, and you can't use the sword. And, and the enemy, when he can get the Lord's people to live defeated lives, it affects their ability to walk properly, and it affects their ability to use the sword effectively and they're basically groveling looking for scraps that fall from the master's table rather than sitting at the table enjoying the banquet that he wants to give them in other words the life of defeat is a miserable life and so the challenge to us is to live a life of victory that the lord has promised Thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so we need to leave, live that life of victory, not the life of defeat. And so we, we might ask ourselves, how, how is our walk and how is our swordsmanship? Are we living a victorious life so that we can walk with the Lord the way he intended us to and use that sword the way he intended us to rather than uh, in this humiliating place of defeat. And it is humiliating. Humi they're living like dogs under the master's table when they, they really, pr prior to that, were, were living as kings prior to the defeat. And so how are we living? And are we enjoying the victory the Lord intends us to have? 
And so notice verse 8. Uh, it says, now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. So, so here we've got Jerusalem now, this, it's this very important city, city of peace. It's very significant in Israel's history. Uh, and what we find here is it's a city that had been defeated, and yet the enemy got back in again. Let me just illustrate for you. Look at Joshua chapter 15, Joshua chapter 15 and verse 63. Joshua 15, verse 63. It says, as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwelt with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. And so at least in the times of Joshua, they couldn't drive out the Jebusites, but then they experienced a great victory against them. It's described here. And, and it says the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it, smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. But now look at chapter one, verse 21 of Judges. It says, and the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Now, it's kind of interesting, almost identical to Joshua 15, except it says the Benjamites. But remember that, that their inheritance uh, of Judah and Benjamin were next to each other. And Jerusalem was kind of on the border between the two of them. And both had failed to drive out the Jebusites. And even when Judah had won and, and defeated it, burned it with fire, it seems that the Jebusites somehow had got back in again and reestablished it. And it wasn't until the days of King David that finally, uh, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 5, finally they're able to defeat the Jebusites. And the Jebusites, even at this point, are still pretty cocky and confident in their ability to win. And so it says, <clears throat> verse 6, of 2 Samuel 5, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. So they felt they were so strong that, they, that even David couldn't defeat them. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. And so what's the point of all this? Why, why am I stressing this? The point is this, that sometimes we can experience a wonderful victory over the enemy and we, we think we're do, we, we've got him whipped and we're, we, we, we've, we're just glowing in, in, the, in victory. But if we're not careful, the enemy can come back and he can come back because the point is our enemies are stubborn. They're very stubborn and they can come back. And they can once again establish a stronghold in our life. And so we, we, we must be diligent in our battle with the enemy. Uh, because uh, how many of you, let's be honest, have had a, an area in your life, maybe some besetting sin, and, and it's caused you problems, maybe even since you got saved. And you experience days where you have great, great victory, and you finally think you've got it whipped, <laughs> And then all of a sudden, something happens. And before you know where you are, the same old enemies come back. And we, we see this with the Jebusites, stubborn, hard to defeat. Finally, in the days of David, they're finally defeated. And Jerusalem comes fully into the hand of the children of Israel. And so, again, very important lesson for us here in our conflicts. Now, verse 9, it says, And afterwards the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain, and in the south, and in the valley. And of course, it describes basically the regions uh, of, of Canaan that were given to Judah, three significant regions. Uh, there's um, uh, that area where Hebron is. Uh, verse 10, Judah went against the Canaanites that dwell in Hebron. And so uh, we've got basically the the whole uh, hill country of Judah, uh, which is that ridge that runs uh, basically Jerusalem right through to Hebron. 
uh, the hill country. And then you have uh, the, the Negev, the southern region. It says they went down south, uh, and that's the, the Negev desert area, uh, semi-arid uh, region uh, from west from Beersheba. And then the western foothills, uh, the Shefala, that uh, was the last area. So they're kind of trying to get the enemy out of all these different areas. And it says uh, they went to Hebron. The name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. They slew Shishai and uh, Hyman and Talmai. And from thence they went against the inhabitants of Debir. And the name of Debir before was Kirjath Sefer. And then it introduces to Caleb and his daughter Aksa and his son-in-law Othniel. And I, I want to just say this is, this is really significant. In a sense, three remarkable characters of faith, all connected with the same family, are brought to our attention here. And I think the point is this. Why is this? this remember, this is the prologue of the book. It's kind of setting the scene for the book. And I think what it's saying to us is this. If everybody in Israel had been like Caleb and his daughter Aksa and his son-in-law Othniel, the book of Judges would tell a very different story. If the contemporaries had displayed the same faith, things would have turned out very, very differently. And so Caleb's brought to our attention. Remember, he's, uh, his name means dog uh, and uh, he, he's got the tenacity of a terrier. He's de determined character. I, I love Caleb. And of course, uh, he's the first man in the wilderness who showed that his heart was wholly set on the inheritance. And, and he, he's never defeated. You never read of Caleb suffering defeat. He's an overcomer. Uh, and um, he, he's, he's always overcoming every obstacle. And, and what an example he is to set before us. And, and we need to ask ourselves, am I the overcomer? Am I living that overcoming life? And who is he that overcomes? Uh, it's, it's those that have faith, those that believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They have confidence in their God. And so are we living that overcoming life? Caleb, this tenacious character, is an overcomer. And uh, no matter what obstacle, he always is ready for the fight and determined to enjoy his inheritance in all its fullness. And Hebron is uh, the name of Hebron has the idea of confederacy. It was formerly known as Kirjath Arbor, uh, literally a, a city of four, and some suggest a city of four giants, uh, because it was where the sons of Anak dwelt, because Anak a giant, three sons who were giants, so the city of four giants. And so, in a sense, it might not be a particularly attractive place to the natural eye, Hebron, uh, just on a mountain ridge, basically, uh, but it's, it's got spiritual significance. It's got a significant link with the patriarchs. It was a place where Abraham, in, back in Genesis 13, let's go back there, that he, he settled there and he built an altar there, very significant place of, of spiritual uh, significance to the people of God, to the, the inheritance of God. Abraham moved his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of memory, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So this place of spiritual significance is a place that Joshua uh, sorry, Caleb set his heart on. And actually, it had been promised him uh, by Moses. Uh, and uh, he was determined to enjoy his heritage. Look back to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. In verse 9, it says, And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance. And thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord thy God. Uh, so a land promised uh, by Moses 
to this man who wholly followed the Lord his God. And remember, it was the place where the giants were there, the sons of Anak, and it was these giants that had petrified the ten spies. But Caleb says, we can have it. We can inherit. The Lord's given them into our hands. And so because he had that confidence, uh, Moses promised him that when they went into the land, he would inherit that. And so that desire to possess it lived in his heart through the wilderness years. And he wouldn't rest until he had taken it out of the control of the three uh, tribes that ultimately emanated from Sheshai, Hyman, and Talmai, descendants of the giants of Anak. He was determined that he was going to get that land. <clears throat> and so um, verse 11, it says, and from thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir before was Kirjath Sefer. Uh, this is, a, a, again, a very fascinating uh, little section uh, in terms of the names, because uh, Kirjath Sefer was its previous name, and that name means city of the book. And many believe it was an administrative, administrative center uh, where Canaanite records and Canaanite literature was kept. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was a place, if you like, a repository of Canaanite wisdom, the city of books. And he said it's going to be called Debir. And Debir uh, basically means oracle. And uh, when we think of an oracle, we think of something given by God. Uh, you remember New Testament language. Uh, it, what advantage has the Jews? Well, <laughs> in every way, God has given to them the oracles of God. Uh, when, when we're to preach, he says, if a man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, the idea of a divine utterance. And so basically, you've got this amazing picture. And I, I want to make sure we get this picture. It's a fabulous picture. So the city that was basically the center of Canaanite wisdom was defeated. And it then, his name is changed to the oracle of God. And what we've got to see is this, that we need to recognize that the wisdom of this world, it, it's really the enemies. And we need to trust fully in the oracles of God and not the wisdom of this world. Because the city of books the center of Canaanite learning, the, uh, the center of their corrupting influence, the, the wisdom of the world, it has to be defeated. And instead, we must establish our confidence in the oracles of God. And we need to be guided and directed by the word of God, not the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world, Paul would tell us, God will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And, and that's what God wants to do. Uh, you know, part of our battle is, is against, uh, really against philosophies and, and the, the, the kind of uh, the wisdom of the world, which is so prevalent in our day. And uh, again, if we're spending all our time listening to, to worldly wisdom, uh, it's going to leave us greatly defeated spiritually. But if we spend our time studying the oracles of God, oh, what a stronghold that is uh, to build your life upon. And so basically we have uh, verse 12. It says, Caleb said, he that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it to him will I give Axa, my daughter, to wife. So there's this, this daughter Axa. Now, her name means adorned or adornment. And the idea is, I'm, I'm sure she was a pretty lady. Obviously, she's a prize that's offered. Uh, I'm going to offer this, this beautiful daughter of mine to anybody that will defeat uh, Kurjath Sefer. And, of course, um, we, we see this in other parts of Scripture. Remember, uh, Saul offered his daughter uh, to David if he would kill a hundred Philistines. 
basically it's a it's it's a, a reward being offered. And so uh, Othniel, whose name means lion of God, uh, or force of God, lion of God, Othniel, uh, he basically defeated an enemy to win for himself a lovely bride. Does that remind you of anybody? Can you think of any lion of God who defeated an enemy that he might win for himself a bride who would be suitably adorned? <laughs> of course, we know the perfect one, the Lord Jesus, who defeated an enemy that he might win for himself a beautiful bride. And of course, we might not look that right now, but one day we will be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Uh, he's going to have a beautiful adorned bride uh, that will be his. And so, and then you've got this other great idea of this chapter is not only uh, does Caleb uh, offer this, his daughter as a wife to the one that can defeat Kerjath Jephyr. Uh, and so Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it and he gave him Axa, his daughter, to wife. And so he uh, had courage to take this city, obviously an important city. If it's got all the records and all the, the literature, uh, it's a very significant, it's an administrative center. If you can take this city, uh, he's worthy of the bride. It's, it's, it's obviously going to be heavily defended. Uh, by the Canaanites. And of course, uh, this, this daughter, she's very much like her father uh, in the sense that uh, she is too a, a woman of ambition. Uh, if, if he said, give me this mountain, uh, she said, give me this field and give me the upper springs and give me the lower springs. Uh, she, she's a great example as well. And so we see uh, in verse 14, it says, it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And so <clears throat> she, she moves uh, Othniel to, to ask her father. And you can I want you to imagine the scene here because I reckon Caleb's there in the, in, in the picture. And so she's saying, go on, ask him. Ask him for a field. And he's trying to pluck up the courage to go and ask Caleb for the field. And obviously, she just didn't have the patience. She couldn't wait. So it says, again, let me read verse 14. It came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ass. And Caleb said to her, what wilt thou? In other words, she's saying to Hobby, uh, go on, go on, ask him. Ask him, ask him to give me a field uh, as well as uh, this courage has ever asked for a field and she can't wait for him. He's deliberating, you know, kind of, you know, kind of intimidating asking your father-in-law for something. So he's trying to decide. And while he's trying to think of it, she, she says, I'll be done with this. She gets off her ass and she goes boldly and she asks and she asks her father, and he recognizes she come to ask something. And he said, what wilt thou? And she said to him, give me a blessing for thou hast given me a Southland. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And again, I want to just, uh, Spurgeon did a phenomenal sermon. And uh, in, 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 you can read it. It's, uh, if you look at ser his sermons on prayer on Axer, a pattern for prayer. Uh, she had boldness to go into the presence of the Father. She asks specifically, and she asks for a blessing. And she's specific about the blessing. She, she wants springs. <laughs> uh, she's asking for springs, upper springs and lower springs. Because what? Uh, a Southland, you know, moving towards the Negev, uh, barren potentially, uh, what's good is a field uh, without water uh, to uh, somehow make it fruitful. And so Spurgeon has got this incredible sermon on her axa as a pattern of prayer. But it is interesting too, isn't it, that you, you have this picture. Really, she, she wanted Othniel. 
to ask, to ask the Father for springs. Here with the Lord Jesus, he's going to ask the Father, and the Father's going to send living water. <laughs> Do you remember this, this spoke, spoke of the Spirit? And <clears throat> I think it's important for us to recognize we need to be asking the Lord that we might have that life that is described in John chapter 7, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. We, we want to live an overcoming life. We want to live a refreshing life, just like these upper springs and lower springs. And we want to live a life that is the abundant life, the spirit-filled life, the spirit-empowered life that out of our innermost being would flow rivers of living water. And Caleb is very willing. It, he says, what do you want? She says, give me a blessing. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And the picture is this, that her father delighted that she had the boldness to ask for these things because just like him, right? He asked, give me this mountain. And also that he, he was, she knew that her father, she knew what her father was like. And she knew that he'd be more than willing to give abundantly what she asked. And so we might ask the question of ourselves, do we understand how much the Father loves us? Lord Jesus says, the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me. <laughs> and so that we know the Father loves us. Do, do you think the Father wants us to live refreshing, overcoming lives? Lives where the Spirit of God is so evident, where, where it's, it's evident to everyone that out of our innermost being, a flowing rivers of living water. <clears throat> it says the father loves to give good, good gifts to his children. How much more shall your father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Now, every believer is indwelt by the Spirit, but not every believer is experiencing the fullness of the Spirit in their lives. And we need to be asking, Lord, I need to live that overcoming life that not only overcomes in a victorious way, but is a refreshing life that out of my innermost being would flow those rivers of living water that will bring fruitfulness in this barren scene that I find myself in. Parched land bursting into fruitful life. Oh, this is what we need to ask with the same boldness that we see here, Axa as she goes into the presence of the Father and asks for a blessing. And he gives it to her. And this is what's needed today. May the Lord encourage us to have this kind of boldness and to live this kind of an overcoming life. We don't want to be like those 70 kings under the table, can't walk right, and don't know how to use their swords. May God help us to learn the lessons from this today. Amen.